The good news of the gospel comes to us today from Matthew 19. And as they say, this may be good news, but it's troubling to some of us to really think about it. Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded, and they said, then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it's impossible. But for God, all things are possible. This is the word of the Lord for us. Well, friends, once there was a poor storekeeper who died. He went to heaven, and when he reached the pearly gates, he was seated outside in the waiting room. He was seated next to a man who was obviously quite wealthy, and before long, St. Peter came to the gate and opened it, and he invited the wealthy man to step in first. The shopkeeper watched through the gates of all that was about to take place, and he was amazed with what he saw. Because as this wealthy person stepped in, there was a choir of angels that greeted him with a Bach chorale. And then the streets were lined with people, and they began to cheer and to chant for this wealthy man. And when the noise died down, St. Peter stepped up and he gave a short speech. And it ended with these words, Welcome to the city of God. Make yourself at home. And then as he was ushered further and deeper into the, to the, the kingdom of heaven, once again, the crowds began to cheer and chant his name. Well, finally, when all the noise and the hubbub died down, St. Peter opened the gate a second time. And this time he invited in the poor shopkeeper. And though he was warmly greeted and welcomed, there was no angel choir for him. There was no Bach chorale. There was no streets lined with people cheering and chanting his name. St. Peter simply said to him, Welcome to the city of God. Make yourself at home. Well, as you might imagine, this shopkeeper was deeply hurt. He told St. Peter, This is the last place that I ever expected to be discriminated against. All my life, I've watched why wealthy people run away with all the privileges and all the benefits. And we poor people, we were always denied it. I thought for sure in the kingdom of heaven, we would be treated equally. But I didn't get a Bach corral when I walked through the gates. Well, St. Peter smiled and very carefully and very tactfully said, Sir, I can see why it seems like you're being discriminated against, but it's really not true. You will be treated exactly the same as that wealthy man as soon as you're inside the kingdom. But you have to understand, this is a very special occasion for us today in heaven. You see, we receive poor shopkeepers here in heaven every day. He said, it's been 80 years since we welcomed a wealthy man. (laughs) And so, friends, here it is again, right in our face. Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. What was he saying? You know, there's been several theories about this. Some people have said that perhaps the Bible got it wrong. Now, this is a true story. I'm not making this up. In the Greek language, the word camel and the word rope are very similar. What separates them is the difference of one letter. And so some people have said, maybe that's what Jesus said. It's easier for a rope to go through an eye of a needle, which would be very difficult, but it would still be a little more possible than a camel, wouldn't it? Maybe, maybe this is a typo in the Bible. And if, if that's true, well, that, that works. Other people have said, you know, maybe Jesus wasn't talking about an instrument for sewing at all. You see, in the ancient world, in the walls of the city, there were these small gates. They were called needles, and they, were, they looked like this. And uh, what happened was when the city came under attack, it was, it was possible for people like you and I to run quickly and to get into the city gates before the, the enemy came. But it would be very difficult for somebody on horseback or with a camel to try to squeeze through that eye of the needle. Maybe that's what Jesus was referring to. Once again, it was possible to get a camel through the eye of a needle, but they had to really squish down and crawl on his hands and knees to get through there. That, that could be one possibility. And then there are those people that say, no, it's just as it says. Jesus meant it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a wealthy person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Regardless of which of those translations or those versions or the interpretations you want to grab onto, I tell you this, it certainly seemed whatever Jesus was getting at, he was saying is that too much wealth 
and too many possessions can be dangerous. Isn't that the bottom line here? One guy said, it's, maybe it's like a circus performer that's up on the tightrope, you know, 40 feet above the, the arena, that's on the tightrope, and he's trying to carry an anvil with him across the tightrope. It weighs him down, this wealth. It throws him off balance. It keeps him away from God. There's a story about a, a Jewish man that went to his rabbi and asked this question. Rabbi, tell me, why is wealth so risky? And the rabbi, the teacher, thought about it long and hard until he could come up with an illustration. And finally, he ushered the man over to a window and he said, look out that glass and tell me what you see. And the man looked out and he said, well, I see a man and a couple women and quite a few children out there. And then he ushered the man over to a mirror and he said, now look in that glass and tell me what you see. And the man frowned and he said, well, of course, I, I only see myself. And then the rabbi gave him this explanation. He said, you know, the window's made out of glass, the mirror's made out of glass, but the difference is there's silver sprinkled on the mirror. And you see, the problem is whenever you begin to sprinkle silver, you cease to see others and you see only yourself. Think about that. Whenever you begin to sprinkle silver, you cease to see others and you see only yourself. Is there a truth to that? With silver and gold and valuable possessions, do you think that they tend to make us act differently? Do we tend to be perhaps a little more selfish and a little more self-centered? I'll tell you this, this is a fact of life, is poor people give more away than wealthy people do. And when it comes to the percentage, is that what wealth does to us? Because when we're wealthy, when we've got all this stuff weighting us down, there's kind of an attitude that says, who needs God? I have everything that I need. I have everything that I want. Who needs God? Maybe Jesus was warning us through these words that, with wealth, with this heavy burden, comes a greater responsibility. There's, a, there's another story I would share with you about a businessman that was walking through Central Park in New York, and he was stopping to get lunch, and so he went over to one of the vendors, and he bought a hot dog, and he bought a soft drink. And as he was walking back to the office, he was, uh, he was asked by two homeless people if he could spare some change. They said, we haven't eaten today. Well, this businessman completely ignored them and just kept right on walking. And later, after he finished off his hot dog and his soft drink, he stopped in a bakery and he was going to pick up just a little bite of dessert. And so he got a beautiful chocolate eclair. How many people like chocolate eclairs? That sounds really good to me at this point in the morning. And he was just ready to take his first bite of that chocolate eclair. A little boy came by and, and, and upset him and he dropped the eclair into the ground. He picked it up, he tried to brush it off, but it was covered with dirt. And just about the time that he was ready to toss that eclair, that dirty eclair, into, the, into a trash bin, an idea occurred to him. He walked over to one of the homeless men that had asked him for money for a meal, and he handed it to him. And with a big smile, he presented it and said, Here, my good man, here is something for your hunger, as if he had done a great thing. Well, it was that very night that the same businessman had a dream. You ever have dreams? He dreamed that he was in a large, crowded cafe. It was filled with waiters and waitresses who were running wonderful food back and forth to the customers at the tables. And every time he raised his hand to try to get the attention of a waiter or waitress, they didn't seem to pay any attention to him. Well, finally, he caught the attention of a waitress, and he asked her for something really good to eat. She came back a little while later with just a small plate. You want to guess what was on it? It was a dirty piece of pastry. It was that chocolate eclair that he had dropped that day. And this man was outraged. He said, you can't treat me like that. I have a right to be served here like everybody else. I expect something good for my money. And the waitress smiled and said very kindly, sir, you don't seem to understand. You can't buy anything here at this cafe. We don't accept money. You see, you've arrived in heaven. And all you can order here is what you've sent ahead from the world behind you. All that you can order here is what you've sent ahead. And sir, the only thing that we have in your records is this dirty piece of pastry. That's all you get. And I would ask you, what are you and I sending ahead of ourselves to the next world? Are they things that God will be proud of? Are they things that we can be proud of? You see, wealth calls us, every last one of us, to be accountable with the things that have been entrusted to us. And I know, now listen carefully, 
I know it's easy to jump to conclusions when we talk about something like this and to think that Jesus was talking about somebody else, my brother-in-law or my neighbor down the street, somebody else. We try to make the case, well, I'm not wealthy, I'm not rich. But listen, there's two problems with that. Please listen carefully here. Number one, anytime the Bible gives an illustration or a parable, God's talking about us. It's not somebody else. You and I misunderstand and misinterpret the Bible when we think that, oh, that's good for him or that's good for her. No, all these stories are good for us. And so we're not really accepting the words of Jesus well if we don't internalize it. And secondly, friends, think with me. You and I here today, we are the wealthy. We are the rich of the world, are we not? We who have not just all that we need, we who have more than... Than we, than we can ever dream of. Meanwhile, there's a world out there of people that are just struggling and scraping just to stay alive. So much more has been entrusted to you and me. We are the very people that Jesus is trying to get the attention of through this parable with the camel and the eye of the needle. We are the people that are in danger of losing our souls, whether we want to admit it or not. And so today, Jesus invites us. Jesus asks us to come and be a part of the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't force us. He doesn't threaten us. But he does try to reason with us. And he reasons this. I want to be first in your life. Not second, not third, not fourth. I want to be first. You know the number one reason why people turn their back on God? People turn their back on the kingdom of God? It's not because of their intelligence. It's not because they're any smarter or any dumber than the rest of us. You know why people turn their back on God? And the kingdom of God, it's not because they're evil people. I truly believe the number one reason people turn their back on God and the kingdom of God is because we're too distracted. You know what I mean by that? Too many other things in life calling for our attention, weighing us down, all these things that we thought that we owned. But don't you wake up someday and think, no, this stuff owns me now. You see, these are the things that move us farther away from God. And this is the very reason that our stewardship is so important because through through our stewardship, we learn to share, we learn to care for others, we learn to give away a portion of what's been given to us. Now, I know there are people in the church that seem to think that stewardship really is just uh, this necessary evil that helps us fund the mission and the ministry of the church. Well, listen, does Bethel need dollars? Yes, we do. Like every church, we do. But stewardship is about so much more than just funding the ministry. As I said before, it's important that you and I be generous people. And as I stand here today as one of your pastors, I make no apologies for asking you to be generous, not just to Bethel, but to other things in life too. I I would not apologize for asking you to be generous any more than a football coach would have to apologize to the team for making them run sprints and do exercises. Those are the things that prepare you for the game. Or a music teacher that that asks students to play scales. Those are the things that prepare you for the game. Friends, part of playing the game of being a follower of Jesus Christ is that we are givers. We are generous people. These things are not optional. These things are essential to our spiritual life. As I stand here and ask you to give, it's the same way that I would ask you to pray. It's the same way I would ask you to read the Bible. You can't be a follower of Jesus without doing these things. See, these are not just to fund the work of the church, but these things, this stewardship, this giving, is for our own benefit. It's for our own responsibilities because it helps lighten our load and it saves our souls from the danger. Each time you and I give, it's like we say, yes to God. It's like we say, I understand what the kingdom of God is about. We become less selfish and more selfless. We open ourselves to others and we find balance in our lives, a a spiritual balance that makes us healthy. Let me close with one last story. And lest you think that Jesus was going just after wealthy people, you know, poor people can be just as greedy. And there was a poor man who was very jealous of the wealth of many of his friends and neighbors. This man would complain outwardly to anybody that would listen to his bitterness. He would say, most of what the wealthy people have, they didn't earn. They inherited from their family, from their parents. 
None of them have worked as hard as I have. Well, one day when this man was out in public expressing his bitterness to the crowd that was trying not to listen but had to listen, an angel appeared to him. And the angel told him, God has decided to give you great wealth. So just hold out your bag and I'm going to fill it up with silver and gold and valuables and all sorts of treasures. But the angel said, there is one condition. The one condition is this. You may never let any of the treasure touch the ground. If it does, everything I've given you will turn to dust. So be careful. See that you don't take too much for yourself. What a deal, huh? So this this poor man was overjoyed. He thought finally he was going to get his due, what he deserved. And so he opened his bag and he watched as this angel began to pour all sorts of treasures into it. And I tell you, that bag was filling up. It was giving, getting heavy. And the angel asked him, when he saw him beginning to sweat holding up this bag, he said, is that enough? And the man joked and said, no, 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 just a little bit more. And as he saw him continue to struggle to hold that bag, he asked, shall I stop now? No, no, I need a little bit more. And then finally, a minute later, have you got all that you need now? Is this enough? No, you can never have too much, the man snapped. Well, you know what's coming with this story, don't you? It was just then that the bag split open from all the weight of it, and it tumbled all over the ground. And as you, as you heard, that treasure just immediately disappeared, all of it. There was nothing left. And the angel disappeared, and the poor man was left there with absolutely nothing. And why? Because he didn't know when to stop. He was blinded by the silver and the gold and the treasure. And friends, the question that perhaps God would ask you and me today is, do we know when to stop? When to stop accumulating stuff? When to stop hoarding stuff and saving stuff? Do we know when to give? Do we know when to send something ahead of us to the world to come? Do we know how to be how to keep from being weighed down in this world, how to make sure that we don't get separated from God. Jesus said these simple words, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a wealthy person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Did Jesus know what he was talking about? I think he did. Do we know what we're talking about? I hope we do. Let's pray. Lord, on this morning, keep us mindful of those things in life that weigh us down, those things that distract us, those things that threaten our very souls. And God, teach us to travel light through this world. Teach us to have faith and to trust you and your words. And teach us how to stay healthy through our giving to others. These things we ask and pray. And all the people of God this morning say, Amen.